brings the news. Your local Oldsmobile dealer, the dealer who brings you famous rocket engine Oldsmobiles, presents an up-to-the-minute account of today's headline news, reported by television's foremost news commentator, Douglas Edwards. And a very good evening, everybody, coast to coast. Tonight, a swelling protest on the handling of the Koji prison incident and uh, two generals on a higher-ranking carpet for sure. The communists are stepping up their propaganda to match the situation. Mr. Bernard Baruch in a verbal back of the hand to the way the administration has been running things. Some news on the housing credit controls and a renewed threat to strike by the Steelworkers Union. Details and more news in just a moment. Right now, rocket ride time. Let's get aboard an Oldsmobile. Look, Johnny, it's a holiday. An Oldsmobile holiday. What a celebration, what a holiday. In a 98 holiday coupe. What an innovation, what a smash sensation. What a great new holiday. Ride the newest rocket, ride the holiday. It's a classic car holiday coupe with its great new style and you'll be driving smile and Oldsmobile's new holiday. The most glamorous automobile in America. Oldsmobile's new classic 98 holiday coupe. Inside too, the 98 holiday sets a new standard of luxury and elegance, unsurpassed in the fine car field. All this with Oldsmobile's new 160 horsepower rocket engine, plus new Oldsmobile hydromatic super drive, and new GM hydraulic steering. Classic performance, classic beauty. Oldsmobile's new 98 holiday coupe. See it, drive it at your Oldsmobile dealers. You can rock it away in a holiday. There's a dealer right near you. The communists over in Korea have been yelling quite a bit lately, louder than usual, too, rejecting the final truce proposals for one thing, filibustering during the meetings, charging that General Colson openly admitted that there has been bloodshed at Koji and uh, that the prisoners there could expect humane treatment in the future. As a matter of fact, that's what Colson did say, but as his superior puts it, that was a statement secured by unadulterated blackmail. It apparently was one of the trading points on which the release of the prison commandant, General Dodd, was brought about. Tonight, there's the feeling in Tokyo and also in Washington that the price was considerably high and that the United Nations cause has been brought into a propaganda target range by the enemy as a result. These are the first films of Brigadier General Francis Dodd as he arrived in Seoul after his safe release from the Koji prison camp where 6,000 prisoners held him hostage for over three days. The general is greeted warmly, but even a warmer reception awaited him as the newly appointed UN commander, General Clark, was uh, getting ready to ask why he placed himself in a position to be kidnapped, for one thing. Together with General Charles Colson, who succeeded him for a matter of hours, they face a military board of inquiry which has already begun on-the-spot investigations. Colson must answer to top brass in the Pentagon for effecting the release by promising to correct conditions which never existed. General Mark Clark, the new Supreme Commander, was to say the least obviously displeased about the way the Koji matter was handled, and today he called the Brigadier Generals Dodd and Colson onto a hot carpet. Nothing specific has been released on what went on at that meeting, but Tokyo hears these six were among the pointed questions General Clark wanted answered in detail. Why did General Dodd allow himself to be placed in a position where he could be kidnapped? Why were there no guards inside the compound who might have rescued him? What did General Colson mean when he admitted to prisoners that there had been instances of bloodshed in the camp? And what did he mean by promising as a condition for Dodd's release that there would be no rearming of prisoners in the future? Why did Colson assure the prisoners they would not have to submit to forcible screening in the future when there never has been forcible screening? And finally, why did Colson permit fanatical prisoners in the kidnapped compound, Compound 76, to communicate with other prison camps on Koji Island? Six questions a lot of people would like to have answered, and among them is Senator Stiles Bridges, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, who was quite adamant about it today. He called the prison camp situation at Koji disgraceful, and he called for a thorough investigation. Bridges went on to say that it's very clear from the record that General Dodd and General Colson, who succeeded him, 
when he was grabbed by the prisoners, acted stupidly in their handling of the affair. That was a statement made, or part of the statement made by Senator Stiles Bridges of New Hampshire. And there are other members of the Congress who say they agree pretty much with what Senator Bridges says on the Koji debacle. Well, this was a day of speeches, certainly, at the Steelworker Convention in Philadelphia. The union got a new administration a lie and Secretary of Labor Maurice Tobin. He gave a blanket endorsement of the union's position in the dispute, the position restated in a resolution passed resoundingly today, which said that the steelworkers won't stay on the job indefinitely without a pay boost. Also addressing that convention, Vice President Alvin W. Barclay, but the Veep carefully avoided detailed comment on the steel dispute, saying only that he hoped that uh, in the progress of negotiation, the union would be able to come out with a victory. And in Washington, an 81-year-old statesman whose words are uh, softly spoken but loudly heard was pointing a finger at the administration for several domestic and international ills. Bernard Baruch. Situation today is not encouraging. Within the last two weeks, we have been publicly warned that 1954 will be the year of maximum military danger. Here and there, some individuals are pressing every effort to speed the rebuilding of our defense. But the general temper is one of letting up rather than bearing down. In fiscal 1951 and 1952, nearly $60 billion were budgeted. One out of five of those dollars, $12 billion, went to cover the rise in prices which followed Korea. No real, determined, all-out effort to prevent inflation was ever attempted. By the end of of the next fiscal year, more than 20 billion will have been poured down the rat hole of inflation needlessly. The recent seizure of the steel mills is the logical offspring of this funding policy that followed the Korean aggression. I do not blame the steel workers for seeking higher wages to offset the rise in their living costs. I do not blame the steel companies for wanting to pass on the increase in their costs by raising their prices. I do blame the government for failing to lay down a standard of equity and justice transcending the selfish concerns of individual pressure groups and protecting the common interests of all. Other important Washington developments today, the Wage Stabilization Board set a general 15 cents an hour ceiling on the amount of wage increase which can be allowed the 90,000 striking oil workers. Chairman Feinsinger says that he'd be surprised if the board's action does not have an immediate effect on the strike, which is now in its third week. And uh, oil and gasoline stocks are growing considerably lower everywhere. About housing, Housing Administrator Raymond Foley says it's quite possible that credit controls may be relaxed on new houses costing above $12,000. Right now, the higher priced ones built or uh, a building require a 50% down payment. That may be relaxed a bit, which is good news to a lot of people. From the State Department, Secretary Atchison gave notice to Russia that the Western powers will stand firm in Berlin in the face of any new attempt to bring pressure on them or uh, by blockade or otherwise. Incidentally, the Russians are allowing traffic to move normally once again on the Autobahn. But back here at home, the mayors got together today. City executives from all over the world checked in at the Waldorf Astoria in New York for the United States Conference of Mayors. Now let's meet the mayor of Athens, Greece. Mr. Mayor, this is your badge as a member of the Mayor's Conference in New York. Thank you very much, I am very glad to be in the United States of America as a guest in the Conference of Mayors. Aloha, everyone. I am very happy to be able to represent the city of Hilo as well as the island of Hawaii here in New York at the 
annual conference of the United States Conference of Mayors. We in Hawaii, I believe, have our problems as far as the municipalities are concerned, I believe similar to those of the mainland United States. However, our biggest problem, and I believe I can safely say the biggest and greatest aspiration of the people in Hawaii is for statehood. I hope that you here in the mainland United States, all over the country, can see your way clear to support Hawaii's aspiration for statehood as the 49th state of this great nation, the United States of America. Lots of mayors in the city of New York tonight as the United States uh, Mayor's Convention gets underway. Well, in the political part of our news tonight, they're still counting the votes which were cast in yesterday's Republican primary in West Virginia. Delegates pledged to Senator Robert Taft of Ohio are leading in 14 out of 16 races. And without waiting for a final count, Taft's managers claim that the victory in West Virginia almost uh, buttons up a first ballot nomination for him at the Republican convention at Chicago. Well, uh, something else now in buttons. This attractive and undecided miss wearing an I Crave Ave button, among others, is a walking display board for the happiest and busiest man in the presidential primaries. He likes Ike, he craves Ave, meaning Averill Harriman, thinks Estes is bestest, wants Truman for ex-president, and is out to hustle for Russell. He's Emmanuel Ress, who manufactures campaign buttons and specialties. Pencils with campaign slogans are a hot item this year, but the biggest demand is for the buttons, millions of them, and this machine, which incidentally has no choice in the campaign, stamps them out endlessly. Mr. S predicts this to be his biggest year, as almost every day brings a new candidate into the field. As for his own choice, he's much too busy to decide whether to back Mac, prefer Kerr, win with Warren, vote right with Dwight, stand for Stassen, or to make the White House the Dwight House. Big worry at the moment is a rhyme for Adlai. One thing for sure, though, next year he'll be back to the old grind, turning out buttons which say, Ain't I Cute. In Major League Baseball tonight, in the National League, the Giants beat the Reds by a decisive 8-2-3 and gained the game on the Dodgers, who were polished off by the cards 5-1. The Braves nipped the Pirates, that score 4-3, Pistol Pete Wisenant, or Wisenant, driving in the running winning run with an infield single. The Phillies trounced the Cubs. That score was 9-2. As you see, Philly pitcher Russ Meyer winning his first game this season after four defeats. And uh, moving into the American League for the scores, the White Sox beat the Red Sox 6-3. Game called because of rain after seven innings. But the score stands. And uh, the Tigers quit the Senators 3-2. The Yanks play the Indians, and the Athletics play the Browns tonight. That's the baseball, and uh, that, by the way, is the news right up to this moment. This is Douglas Edwards reporting coast to coast and saying good night, everybody, for Oldsmobile. Words with the CBS Television News is brought to you by your local Oldsmobile dealer. See your local Oldsmobile dealer soon. Drive Oldsmobile's new classic 98 and the brilliant new Super 88. Thrill to the new 160 horsepower rocket engine. New Hydromatic Super Drive. New GM Hydraulic Steering. Oldsmobile's automatic headlight dimmer. The new Autronic Eye. And always see your authorized Oldsmobile dealer for the finest in factory approved service. Yes, for new highs in motoring value and enjoyment. Your smartest deal is Oldsmobile. Douglas Edwards and the News is produced under the supervision and control of CBS Television News. Portions of this program were on film, part of which was supplied by Telenews Productions. This is the CBS Television Network.